Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Man, have we got a show for you today. Do I say that every time? Well, because I mean it. I mean, this is one of the fastest growing podcasts in America, and I am a proud podcaster. So why shouldn't I brag, right? On today's show, Don Bentley, author of Tom Clancy's Zero Hour. Now, if you're a Tom Clancy fan, you're in for a treat. If you're a Don Bentley fan, you're in a double treat because this guy can flat out write. It's a Jack Ryan Jr. novel. And uh, I say we just cut right to it because we only have an hour and I want to squeeze in as much information as I possibly can for you, my loyal and lucky listener. So without any further ado, welcome to The Thriller Zone and Don Bentley. Hey, David. How's it going? Very good, Don. How are you? Top of the morning. Good morning. We got a new angle. That's what's new with you. Yeah, switching it up a little bit. Um, welcome to the green room. Before we get started, I want to say uh, the interesting thing I found when I was at the Thriller Fest. All you guys are way more buff than I, you know, than I see on camera. And I'm like, you walked by, and I'm like, Jesus, look at him, man. He must work out every day. <laughs> yeah it's a good way to burn off stress i was uh before i was writing full-time i was working for a subsidiary of an israeli company and you um you get to to uh their way of talking to americans a lot of times is is comes across a lot like screaming so there'd be more than one time where i'd finish a call with them like i just gotta go do deadlifts or something until i uh get back under control so yeah. yeah uh and uh let's see who else uh so then you got uh uh mark Rainey, who uh i had no idea he was that tall yeah he's a big guy he's Jeez. a big dude and then i've seen his home gym that's legit <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's always cool to see your heroes your peers your mentors in person you know yeah, likewise. I mean, it's it, it's always fun. And this one felt more, uh, it'd been three years since we'd all seen each other. So it felt more like a, a family reunion than anything else. It was great. Yeah, it did, didn't it? Anyway, welcome officially to back to the Thriller Zone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Man, do you realize it's been, I did a little homework. It was uh, August of last year, you were uh, guest number 12 on the show. Oh, nice. Nice. You've had a couple more than that in the last year, huh? Uh, let's see. You make 71 when this airs nice. on Thursday. Nice. Bam! It's kind of amazing. I was talking to my wife uh, over dinner the other night and we were, I was saying, you know, it's hard to believe that I remember, I remember having this inner, almost inner dialogue. Oh, is anybody going to listen to this podcast when I was thinking mm -hmm. about putting this together? Does anybody care? You know, and then all of a sudden I'm like, of course they do. Who doesn't love thrillers? And I'm going to be able to talk to the coolest cats in the biz. So uh, let's <laughs> let's give it a give it a twirl. And here we are a year later. And uh, oh, by the way, did you see who's uh, wrapping up this month and is celebrating the one year anniversary? No, who? Dean Koontz. Oh, wow. That'll be incredible. That'll be incredible. <laughs> I hope I don't. Uh, I'll soak my shirt. Anyway, so <laughs> la last time we were together, we were discussing your Tom Clancy thriller, Target Acquired, which I got to admit, I really liked. But uh, I think I think I liked Zero Hour even better. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Um, Thank yeah. You. And the, I don't even know why um, it, it, shoot, it comes out. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. It comes out of the gate with such a relentless. I mean, you have been <laughs> You've always been good at your starts, but this one really screams out of the gate. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, uh, I spent almost two years in Korea straight out of flight school, and uh, it was a great place to, to learn your craft as a young officer. Um, back then, like it was the late 90s, and back then that was kind of the, the closest to um combat that you could get because the the korean peninsula is still under just an armistice and, and north korea would ever so often shell south korea or do something like that and so anyway I, I took a whole lot from that and one of those being i remember i used to have to go we were in a, in a little tiny 
it was called Camp Eagle and we were really the only, it was just our attacks or our cav squadron that was there. And then some maintainers and stuff, but I'd have to go to some of the other garrisons um, either to, to fly in the simulator or for administrative stuff. And I remember standing outside the gates of the Yongsong garrison uh, one time waiting my turn to go in and not really paying too much attention. And all of a sudden I looked to my left or right and there were this crowd of people uh, I was coming in and I realized I was in the middle of a demonstration unintentionally. And it was uh, kind of this, it, the, the, nothing terrible happened um, that time or anything, but I always thought, man, that would be a great way to start a book and to give people kind of unique taste of, or, or a taste of what is unique about Korea. And the, the demonstrations was certainly one of them. So it was a fun way to start zero hour for sure. Now, for my listeners paying attention, that's what I love is the fact that you, th this is the perfect example of a writer who is <clears throat> completely engaged in a moment and says later, uh, says to themselves, hey, this would be a great opening and then transplants mm -hmm. it into the book. And because of the visceral nature of your experience, you're able to sure. infiltrate that scene with that that sizzling uh, electrifying reality. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I think that's the, that's what makes everybody, or that's maybe one of the things that makes you a great writer is taking a scene that is um, maybe a little bit benign in real life. And then thinking to yourself, how could you amp that up and change things? Or what would have happened if, if the, if the demonstration would have gone uh, become more violent or something like that. And then you want to take all those things and, it pour them in the book because that's the part that people, I think people in the, especially in this genre are looking for a certain amount of veracity where they can say, okay, this, I believe this, this isn't, you know, I'm, I kind of use this example a lot. I, I like the, some of the, the crazier movies The I made my kids watch the last uh, Fast and Furious spin off a couple of times. And it was fun for a lot of reasons, but in, in no way do you ever uh, mistake that for reality. And I think as a, as a thriller writer, you kind of got to thread that needle and give people touch points where, where they're willing to say, yep, there's enough here that I believe what's going on, but then I'm certainly not uh, writing nonfiction either. And so many of the things I spin are, are uh, uh, you're pushing the edge on the believability envelope too. And I think people will forgive you that if you start with the touch points um, that ground them in the real life or, or make them believe that it's grounded in real life. That is so superb. And and you maybe think of something, Don. Have you seen Top Gun yet? Not yet. Hoping this week. It, it's been hard to get all of the family schedule synced. So <laughs> I've been waiting in my entire life to see the sequel to Top Gun. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I want to say this, and I don't think I'm going to ruin it. It's just it was really cool that Tom comes on before the movie starts and says mm -hmm. something like, I really worked extra hard i'm paraphrasing extra mm -hmm. hard to make this movie the best it could be and to make it uh yeah. believable so that in plane flying that's all mm -hmm. real there's no yep. cgi yep. and i was like wow i hadn't heard anything yeah. about it yeah there have been quite a few behind the scenes leading up to it little clips where he shows the what he came up with, I'm sure with the producers and stuff is kind of the training program for the pilots, uh, the actors who were pilots, and then, you know, what it was like flying in actual F-18s and how they had to do from a camera perspective and stuff. And it's just, it's just fascinating. Yeah. I purposely didn't read or listen to any of that stuff because I mm -hmm. didn't want uh, anything to be uh, tainted. Yeah. I didn't want to have any inside secret or inside sure. work. By the way, speaking of um, speaking of fans, is myself. Um, how is your in person? You know, we're talking about being in person book signing recently. It looked I, I saw you in uh, you were in Georgetown, Texas, with Brad Taylor, mm -hmm. Scottsdale with my pal yep. Chris Hottie, and Dallas with David McCloskey. Yep. T tell me what that situation is because that's kind of cool. Instead of you just going solo and talking yeah. about your books. Yeah, I was also in Cincinnati with Jessica Strasser, so she was kind enough to come and. Yeah. moderate I, I think the especially obviously there are tiers of writers and there are folks who um you know I, i'd sign up to go see michael conley speak regardless of who he was with or who he wasn't but i think for those of us who are um still starting out and much much lower on the ring that you really want to one of the good things of covid um 
was when we had to do it all virtually, somebody had the idea of saying, well, you know what? We can bring any two authors together um, that we want now because you know everything's everything's happening virtually, and we can give we can give fans more of an experience than they would get with a single author on their own. And so I really really liked that idea, and so was able to choose some some authors I really respect. I mean, I read um, like I think most of the nation read uh, Damascus Station and just love David McCloskey's books, and he's so so good and. I've been a fan of Jessica Strasser for a long time. She was um, the the editor of Writer's Digest, and Writer's Digest uh, played a big role in in my development as an author. And then certainly Brad Taylor has been a uh, a mentor of mine and kind of a big brother uh, to me for a long time. And and I love and and part of it is I think if you is having those relationships um, author to author, and you kind of give the people who attend just a chance to be a fly on the wall as you're yeah. having a conversation, you know, two writers together. And it was just so much fun. And Chris Hottie is a great guy as well. I'd gotten to meet him um, when uh, Deep State first came out, his first book first came out. And um, it was just so much fun. And I think it's, I think more importantly, though, is that, you know, it, it gives the people who show up a better experience. And that's really what, what you want. You want the people who show up it to be worth their time and money to come to a signing for yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm going to echo a couple of your sentiments. First of all, Damascus Station, talking about a hell of a debut. That would by mm -hmm. David McCloskey. Just amazing. What a super nice guy. Yep. Um, and then Chris Hottie, uh, we spent entirely too much time hanging out at Thriller Fest, and he, <laughs> he's become a good pal. He Just a smart, funny, riveting guy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Brad Taylor, much more... Uh, chillaxed kind of a guy than I pictured, you know, <laughs> I think on his website, he's standing there, you know, with that really hard ass look and y you think he's all business, but man, he's, he's just shooting and laughing yeah. and he's anyway, again, yeah, fantastic. No, he's great. He's great. And his wife, Elaine, is fantastic too. She does uh, much of the business side and marketing side of their arrangement. She's a fantastic lady. We're going to, of course, as I said, we're going to talk about zero hour, but I do want to back up since my mind was reflecting about you early this morning when we were talking about a year ago. And mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about Matt Drake for just one minute. Yeah. Uh, without sanction, which is, you know, this is, I keep this handy whenever I just need a little inspiration of your kind of thriller. I literally, I do this, which is why they get all bent out of shape and I'm marked up. <laughs> but I'll like, okay, how can I start this scene or how can I, how can I say something with a military twist? Because I'm a, I don't know anything about it like you sure. do. And I'm like, okay, okay, got it, got it. And then I'll get back <laughs> to my business. Um, so yeah, without sanction, uh, outside man, hostile intent, three exceptionally well-crafted mm -hmm. thrillers. Um, two part question. Uh, what is next? And I, you know, I know I'm cutting into zero hour a little bit, but this no, is no, no, it's fine. My it's own fine. curiosity. What's next for Matt Drake? And when are we going to find out for ourselves? Yeah, so the so hostile intent you were talking about was just came out um, the beginning of last month, and that was uh, featured a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so I just turned in, in fact, right before Thriller Fest, I turned in the fourth book in the Matt Drake series, which is called uh, Forgotten War. And so that was uh, like most. Um, people who served in Afghanistan, you know, watching what happened um, last summer, the, the train wreck that was our withdrawal from Afghanistan just really hit me and it hit me um, in, in kind of a visceral way. And, and I got a lot of text messages from fellow veterans um, who had served in Afghanistan or Iraq or both. And what kind of being echoed over and over again was some variation of the question, was it worth it? Was the 20 years we spent there worth it? Was the you know, the, the blood and treasure and the sacrifices and the time spent away from home and the, the comrades lost, was that worth it? And so that really, really impacted me. And so um, when I sat down to write what would become Forgotten War, I knew that I wanted to have Afghanistan be a part of that. And so I decided, and, and then at the same time, I'd been, you know, it's the fourth book in the series and uh, had God, and I try and listen to readers, um, the response of readers as much as I can, because at the end of the day, it's our job to give readers what they want. And, you know, lots of people love uh, the character Frodo and wanted to see more of him. But because of 
Yeah, you know, in without sanction, you, you kind of hear Frodo's backstory and, and know why he's been grievously wounded. And so while he and Matt were operational together um, for a while, you don't ever see that in the current books just because of, of um, Frodo's injuries. And so originally I had the idea of um, setting the book as kind of a prequel where you could see Matt and Frodo in, in their first adventure together. And so when I talked to my editor, Tom Colgan, about it, he said, why don't you read Mark Graney's um, Sierra Six instead, because he does this great job of having multiple timelines and take a look at that. And so that's what Forgotten War is. There's two different timelines. And so one is during the fall of Afghanistan, kind of last um, summer, where, you, where um, you see Matt has to go back to Afghanistan for part of an operation. And then the other, you get to see 10 years prior um, during Matt and Frodo's first operation together in Afghanistan. And so it was it was really, it was fun to write. It was certainly very, um, very hard to write because what I wanted to do, the, the way I kind of kick it off is that Matt and Frodo are in a bar together in Austin and um, two army CID agents come in and they arrest Frodo and they arrest him for murder. And Matt figures out that the murder is, um, it was supposedly occurred in Afghanistan 10 years prior. And when Matt and Frodo were, were supporting um, this operational detachment alpha, this, this Green Beret team for, for a very short period of time, and that um, as Matt tries to figure out what happens, he realizes that the surviving members of this team are dying one by one under mysterious circumstances. And so he, uh, he tries to get Frodo to tell him what happened. And when he visits Frodo in jail, Frodo, the only thing Frodo will tell him is that I belong here. I belong here. I'm guilty of murder. And so Matt has to go back to Afghanistan to try and figure out what happened 10 years earlier during that operation. And so you get to see both of those timelines. And so it's very much it's a lot different than anything I've done before. On, on, on some sides, it feels kind of like a whodunit uh, where you're where Matt's trying to unravel this this um, mystery of what happened and why Frodo would be charged with murder. And then at the other side, it's all with the backdrop of Afghanistan crumbling and you get to see all of these other um, folks who served who are veterans that pop in and their kind of reaction to it. And then you also get to see Matt and Frodo together during the first tour in Afghanistan. So really, really excited about it. It'll, it'll come out, I think, um, May of, of 2023. So that's what's next for them. Wow. That's amazing. And, uh, Got to meet Tom Colgan, mentioning mm -hmm. Tom again. What a what a brilliant guy. And I don't know, between his output and, and what he's able to accomplish and how, the volume he has to read. Yeah. Yep. I, I can't comprehend it. Yeah, he works. I work a lot as a writer, um, but I think he works more than I do because there's he's an old school editor um, from the standpoint of when he was coming up in the craft. And I think a lot of editors still adhere to this, but one of the golden rules is that you never edit during your time in the office. And so while he's in the office, he's working on, you know, the myriad of other things that editors do, but then he's constantly reading at home. And that's where he does a lot of his editing is sitting on his front porch, uh, editing books. And so he's, whenever I think I'm working really hard, I also think, well, He's uh, he's probably working just as hard as I am between, <laughs> you know, all the books that he's editing and then all the submissions he gets and stuff like that. But he's a fantastic editor. He just this is one of the things that, that's really cool about Tom is he sent me this copy of Zero Hour in the mail. But the other thing that he does is he sends you a personalized note as part of that about what his thoughts were in the book and, you know, why he thinks the book is special. And it's just it's a thing you certainly don't have to do as an editor, but it's one of the things that makes him very special is that, you know, that very personal touch of, hey, you really, you know, you really pushed the boundaries on this book. You really did some things that even I had thought so. And I just, you know, want to tell you in a handwritten note form, you know, how proud I am of you for doing that. And so he's just a fantastic guy to work with. I can't say enough good things about Tom. Yeah, that is so nice to hear. And uh, I didn't get to spend time with him uh, much at Thriller Fest. He is going to yeah. be on the show because we're going to expand the show a little bit so that we can uh, learn more about the business of nice. Thriller Writer. 
uh, man, he's agreed. I want to bounce back to Sierra Six with our mutual pal sure. uh, Mark Rainey because that dual timeline was mind bending. It took yeah. me just. It takes you just a second to get into the rhythm, and then once you do, yep. it's fascinating. So the fact that he uh, suggested that as an alternative or possibility for yeah. you in your book. Yep. Brilliant. I think that's going to be fascinating. Yeah. And, and just as a disclaimer, like Mark really, I, I think if you took Sierra six and broke it in half, he probably has close to half the book that's in the alternate timeline. I ended up not going, I have a long sequence that's the alternate timeline, but not is, I, I don't know how he did that. I don't know how, because as you said, part of the thing he does so effortlessly that you don't even notice is that you never feel like you're losing one story as the other one comes on. And he he weaves those together so it's never, it's never jarring to the reader. And it's never also another really hard thing to do when, when you have any multiple points of view is that you want all of those climaxes to happen at the same time, but you don't want one to detract from the other. And so figuring out when to put those in and then also when to, when you have these huge climaxes, you have to give the reader space to breathe again and for their heartbeat to come back down and the narrative to settle. Because if you just do climax after climax, then you lose the effect of those big moments too. And so he just does that effortlessly in that yeah. book. It's it's amazing. And, and it's hard enough, like I said, to do in one narrative, but to manage it in two is just incredible. He's, he's a, uh, Mark is, um, he's, Tom calls him brilliant, um, which I don't, I don't disagree with, but he's also just extremely hardworking and he just shows up every day and makes the donuts and, and does it in a way that's different every single time. And he's a, he's an incredible writer and he really has pushed the, the envelopes of this genre. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing about Mark uh, that I find is when you, you know, having done radio in my past and met, you know, rock stars and authors mm -hmm. and movie stars, there's a certain air that often can come with them that isn't sure. always necessarily sure. fantastic. Yep. That could not be further from the truth than yeah. Mark because you yeah. meet him and you like, he's he's kind of like the, the rock star of mm -hmm. the thriller writing genre, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, and and so and so chill and so yeah mm -hmm. it's just what i do but this is what i learned because he was just on the show um it's just that work ethic he goes you know what it is you just you got to show up and you got to put mm -hmm. in the time i've heard you say that i've heard yeah. the really great guys who really know what it takes they don't this is interesting donna i hope you re feel this similarly they don't talk about what they're doing they shut up to the yeah. world and they do what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's, I think, you know, one of the, one of the books that everyone likes to quote from is, you know, Stephen King's on writing is one of the premier, I think, books about writing. And he, um, he does a great job of delineating the magical part of the writing versus the blue collar part, as he phrases it. And the, the blue collar part, I think is the, is the vast, makes up the vast um, majority of writing and it's the the least sexy part. It's the showing up and, and putting your butt in the chair and getting words out every day. And his, you know, his thesis that I think Mark's a great example of and Brad's a great example of and many of these folks is that you, the, the, the prize, if you will, doesn't go to the person who's maybe necessarily the best wordsmith or the most brilliant um, person with prose or, even maybe has the most original story. It's the person that produces year after year and that you keep, and I don't mean mean to imply because it's certainly not the case that their the quality of their work suffers or anything like that, but you can't, you know, there are very few writers who can write, you know, one brilliant book and that and that make their career. It's it's much more often the people who just continue to produce and continue to produce year after year and get better and push the envelope. And that's when the magic starts to happen is because they get better and better at their craft because they're working harder and harder at it and continuing to produce at it. And then what they begin to produce kind of takes on a life of its own, if you will, it becomes better and it becomes because of that work ethic, but so much of it is, you know, and, and that's, that's true across life. I think if you look at the folks who are the most successful 
arguably it's it's not necessarily the folks blessed with the most talent as it is the the folks who are willing to work when mark says something i think about all the time where he says you know when i get to the point where i want to quit i think 90 percent of the rest of the people quit right now too and so if i write one more paragraph if i do one more day if i do whatever I'll be past where 90% of the rest of the world is. And so I put my head down and continue to work. And I, I think about that a lot is that when you're, when you're at the point where you're writing and you're, you're at the point in, in drafting that book where you're tired of it, where you're, it's gone farther than you think, it's bigger than you think. And you think, you know what, I could, I could take the easy way out and wrap this up right here and be done with it. And nobody would look sideways of it, or I could push on and I could try one more thing I could do. And I, you know, think kind of like, what would Mark do right now? Mark would take the hard route and push one more day. And so it's, I can't say enough good things. Like I said about he, he and Brad, both uh, Brad Taylor have just been so incredibly generous um, with their time and their offering insight and, and really saying, you know, here's, here's how it was for me. Here's some things that went wrong. Here's some things that went right. And uh, you know, do with this as you will. They're just both incredible folks. I'm going to get t-shirts made up for us and it's going to go, what would the grainy man do? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Hey, listen, we're going to take a short break and when we come back, we're going to talk about this beautiful book, Tom Clancy's Zero Hour with our guest, Don Bentley. So don't move. Hey, everybody. I'm Don Bentley, New York Times bestselling author of Hostile Intent in Zero Hour, and I am hanging out with Dave on the Thriller Zone. And welcome back to the Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Tom Clancy's Zero Hour by the effervescent and massively, madly talented Don Bentley right there in front of us. Thanks for having me. Dude, I always like the fact that you, um, I mean, yeah, you come with a bevy of experience. You've, you've put in sure. real world time, but you put in real world time with books too. Talking yeah. about Tom Clancy, you did a Target Acquired, which was my first introduction to the Tom Clancy world through you. Mm-hmm. And I was doing my uh, research in retrospect, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we celebrated our 12th episode together uh, back in mm-hmm. August. But Target Acquired came out third and sixth at New York Times combined and hard uh, cover bestsellers mm-hmm. list respectively, and at number three on USA Today. And it made me go, does every single solitary book that the Clancy franchise uh, premieres, is it always a New York Times bestseller? Like every single one of them, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, it's incredible um, when you, like I can look at the Amazon numbers um, for my books and uh, my books that are in the Clancy universe. And there has Tom Colgan has done such a good job of um, keeping that franchise alive that readers um, are willing to go in and buy that regardless of who the author is because they trust uh, the editor for it. And so it was I can't remember if it was Target Acquired or it was Zero Hour, but one of those two books was hitting some of the Amazon um, bestseller list when it was. <laughs> when it was just a blank book, it didn't even had a title and it just said Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan Jr. Number nine. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, the readers trust that um, that franchise is going to continue to deliver the experience they've always loved about it. And, and that's really, you know, though they don't know it or wouldn't be able to articulate it, it's that they're trusting that Tom Colgan has gone out and found the right people to write it again. And so you'll see, um, those books will move up and down the list. Sometimes it's the numbers you describe. Sometimes they're higher or lower, but you can see that readers really love them. And I'm super cognizant of, I probably read reviews more than a lot of readers do because, or a lot of writers do just because I think it's, you certainly have to take it with a grain of salt, but I, in my past life, I sold things for a living and you're you always want to know what your customer thinks. You always want to know what your customer wants. You always want to know what are their expectations and are they, and are you meeting them or not? And, and people will tell you, they'll tell you in reviews what they liked, what they didn't like, what they want to see next time. 
<laughs> and so it's so I do that a lot. And then I try to with each series, with each one I write, go back and read a couple of his older books and a, lot, a couple of Tom Clancy's older books and then see what I can do to give nods to those or to pay homage to them or, or to remember why I love them as a reader and try and incorporate some of those in the books that I write for sure. Okay, now I got to ask this. I don't think I knew this. Are you telling me that Tom Colgan is single-handedly responsible for keeping the Clancy universe alive? Yeah, absolutely. So he um, he has been the editor for those for that series since um, Tom was still alive for his last couple, and then uh, and then once Tom passed, um, he's been the editor for all of those books, and so he is. Uh, the Clancy Foundation has has um, has just really come to trust him and really trust, come to trust him as an editor that he is going to to bring in writers that share his vision and share the the foundation's vision and will will stay true to that. And so, you know, I, I don't I can't remember off the top of my head when. Well, I mean, we're coming up, I guess, on the tenth anniversary of Tom's passing. So, mm. you know, at least ten years, maybe eleven years or something. Tom Colgan's been at the helm of that. That is mind blowing. Well, I was trying to think of, I always like to figure out how can I boil it down to one thing? And so sure. here's all you really need to know. Going back to the phrase that you said, people would uh, buy the book just knowing that it's Tom Clancy. Jack Ryan Jr. is the one man who could prevent a second Korean war. I could stop right there. And you'd go, okay, I'm going to read that missile on the front. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do is it, that's my bite size take on it. If you were sure. to do it, give, give my audience a little bit more tease that only you could do without giving it away. Yeah. So I think, like I said, my, um, my first duty assignment out of flight school was um, the Korean peninsula. And it's, and it's a very interesting um, place to work. The, North Korean Army has um, the largest um, detachment of special operations forces of any nation in the world. And the reason for that is that they train their special operations teams almost as, as uh, human cruise missiles. And so with the way they use them is right before a conflict would kick off, they will flood South Korea with special operations teams. And they do that through uh, really fast boats that they shoot down both sides of the coast. And they also have these uh, airplanes that are called AN-2 um, Colts that are kind of actually made of wood. And so they're very hard to see on radar. And they'll bring these planes in and, and parachute special operations folks out. And so their job, the special operations teams, are to um, take out certain members of the South Korean government, perhaps, and then just set the conditions and cause trouble in South Korea um, until the North Korean folks uh, who are invading can link up with them. And so it's a complete one-way mission. There's no exfil plan. And in fact, North Korea will often send these teams into South Korea as part of their training, as part of their final exercise. They'll, they'll go through South Korea and then infiltrate back north. And, and when I think it was either when I was there or shortly before I was there, they actually had a Korean, they call them midget subs, these very small submarines that are designed just to infiltrate um, commandos. One of those uh, submarines uh, washed up on shore. They found it in a, in a sandbar. And so the crew of that submarine was laid out on the beach, all of them killed. Because what happens is the, is the commandos are equipped to operate in South Korea, but the sailors are not. So the first thing the commandos did is killed their own countrymen so they wouldn't be a drag on them as they went to escape. And then they went causing trouble across South Korea. And so I always thought it would be really, really interesting to um, show how that conflict would play out. And so all of this, the way all of this relates to zero hour is that you have a um, despotic leader in, in North Korea that is you know, part kind of the Stalinist um, form of dictatorship and then part kind of almost uh, a, um, a, a king that, or a, that's passed down from father to son. Or, and, and, and so um, I, I, what I did was show a, a vacuum in that power structure where something happens to the leader of, of North Korea 
And, and the thing that every dictator fears is, is there really isn't a such thing as a peaceful transfer of power, right? That if right. you are, you either die in office like Stalin did, or somebody comes and drags you out in the street and kills you like what happened with Gaddafi. And so I thought to myself, you know, if I was the leader of North Korea right now, I would have programmed in some fail safes that if something happened to me, if what would I have programmed in to try and guarantee my regime's um, survival? And so what you see when Zero Hour kicks off is there's an event that happens that incapacitates the North Korean leader, and his incapacitation kicks off a series of dead man switches in the form of these, these North Korean soft operatives, these sleeper agents we talked about before, yep. who are in South Korea and kind of get their go to war mission um, based on these dead man switches. And so that happens uh, on the Korean Peninsula as Jack Ryan Jr. is there to meet with somebody who could be a helper for the campus. And so the campus is this off the bo books intelligence organization that he's a part of. And I kind of like the Daniel Silva has a great set of books that feel uh, features a Mossad operative. And one of the things he constantly says about the Mossad is they're a very small service um, when compared to other intelligence services. And the way they make up for that is through, you know, quote unquote helpers, where they have Jews all over the world who will do things like slide on the, a hotel key or, you know, give them an untraceable rental car or do things where they're not um, necessarily in the employee of the Mossad, but they're helpers for that that make a small intelligence service seem bigger. And so I thought, you know, that would be really neat for the campus too, yeah. is if there were these network of helpers. And so Jack Ryan Jr. is in South Korea to interview one of these helpers when the potential um, second Korean war kicks off. No, <laughs> no. Folks, if you don't, if you, if you don't uh, want to pick up the book after that, then you're just, you're sleeping at the <laughs> wheel. And, and, there's even a little, little bit of love story in there. So you, you get all the bases covered. I mean, <laughs> it really is uh, the best of all worlds. I want to go back. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to something because you were talking about how you keep a track on things. Mm -hmm. and the book went on sale. It was uh, last week. And I've always been curious, how closely do you personally monitor the movement of the book once it drops? Like, do you, do you check the daily counts? Do you watch the trends, the sales? And how does that work for yeah, you? Yeah, I look at the Amazon numbers quite a bit because it's, um, it's interesting um, to me. I feel like what it does is give me a vantage point into, you know, one of the biggest franchises in the industry. And so my, my series, my Matt Drake series with Hostile Intent is – is kind of chugging along, but I am certainly nowhere near um, the scale of the Clancy books. And so it's for me, like I said, my past life um, before I wrote full time, I you know was in the business world. And in the business world, what you do is benchmark products, and you say how well does this one sell? What are the things that make it sell? Uh, how close is that to my product? And should I be doing something different with my product so that it sells as well as this other product I can benchmark? And you know, the Clancy one is a fantastic one to benchmark because you can see how it moves and when it moves and um, maybe what makes it those numbers go up or down. Or and It's a little like I said, I think you have to you have to take Amazon numbers or book selling numbers a little bit with a grain of salt because it's also like the stock market, right, where you right. can look into that and, and you can you can come up with a thousand different reasons of why it is or isn't selling. But it's been it's been really helpful for me as a, you know, up and coming kind of fledgling author to be able to, to peer behind the curtain a little bit and watch. And, and frankly, that's part of the fun of being a writer is you get to see, you know, as the numbers go up, as they hit the bestseller list, where do they hit and stuff. And so it's, it's one of the fun parts um, to me about being a, a writer. And I, like I said, I am very much uh, along for the ride. Those Clancy books sold amazingly well before me they sell amazingly well with me and when it, whoever takes off after me i'm sure i'm sure they will sell amazingly well with that person too but it's it's fun to watch and it's fun to watch you know something that you've written go out into the world and get as as wide of a dissemination as the clancy books do so yeah and back to that point, you know, I'm sitting here looking at the uh, uh, all the other books that are written, mm -hmm. and I've got, let's see, we got Grant Blackwood, Peter Tellup, Mark Graney, 
uh, Mike Madden, uh, Mark Cameron, and then you. And I wonder, uh, is it because I've never asked any of you guys, do you, mm -hmm. is there a certain pattern or, you know, with, does Tom go, Hey, Mark, for instance, it's your turn. Okay. Now, Don, it's your turn. Now, Mark Cameron, it's your turn. How does that work? Yeah. So I think, so Tom's job is to go find the right writer for the series. And he would, um, both for the series sake and, and for, um, I'm assuming his sake, what he wants is for that writer uh, to stay in the series for as long as possible. And so what what happens, because he's very, and he doesn't just do this with the Clancy books. So he manages the Ludlum Estate books. He manages um, the, the WB Griffin books or, or did. I'm not sure if they still do or not. And so there are a whole bunch of series that he has um, become responsible for finding writers for. And so I, I don't know that it's, like I said, I'm sure if Tom had his way, you know, Mark Graney would still be writing these books and, and he would have never had to change. But eventually, as you know, for, for different reasons, writers will choose to move on. And when right. they do, you know, he finds um, writers to replace them and then um, brings them up to speed and, and tries to keep them in that position for as long as possible. And so it's not like I said, it's not um, certainly I would imagine if you if you write a book and your um, book, your version or your Clancy book isn't performing as well as some of the other ones, maybe he would um, want to try and find another writer to do that. So you're not guaranteed um, that you get to be, uh, you know, for any amount of time other than what you sign a contract for. Sure. But I think I think Tom uh, is good enough at picking writers. I would I would doubt that that's ever come up. I think yeah. he he picks really good writers, and the writer usually stays there until. Uh, they figure out or, or they come to the conclusion that they don't have anything more to offer the series, because I think what you're what's always forefront in your mind is that the Clancy name comes first and the Clancy yeah. Foundation comes first. And so you're going to be there for as long as you think you can still contribute something. But when you get to the point where you're like, man, I don't know that I have anything new, what you don't want to be um, the person who who is a drag on, on the storyline <laughs> instead. Right. And so, and I think the writers are pretty good at, at figuring that out when they get to the point that says, okay, I've, I've given everything I can to that series. It's time for somebody new to come along. Yeah. I think I was late to the game when I finally realized that Tom <clears throat> was an insurance broker who just had a real passion for naval history and sure. and and poof there was the world and you know he started mm -hmm. hitting home run right out of the gate so yeah. yeah yeah but i don't want to i heard you use the phrase uh up and coming and fledgling for yourself but i uh, fledgling mm, up and coming for sure rock star uh, definitely but i read uh, where a reporter said and I love this quote, Bentley taps into his ideal background as an author and military expert to hit the trifecta of what makes a great Clancy thriller. And it's three things. Mm -hmm. Tom's terrific characters combined with edge of your seat action and over the horizon presence about uh, world events. Now, when I read that, I thought, what is Don thinking and feeling when he sees that? Because that's about as good as it gets. Yeah, that's that's really uh it's uh, a really humbling compliment. I think um, folks, a lot of times there are, there are a lot of us now who are writing in this genre that are military veterans or have um, like for Mark Cameron's perspective, uh, sake, he wasn't a military veteran, but he had extensive law enforcement experience. So I think a lot of people think that that's necessary. And I would, you know, you kind of touched on it before the, People like to refer to Tom Clancy as an insurance agent with a library card, and so he had he had none of that military experience. He had none of that. He uh, Mark Graney had none of that. Uh, Vince Flynn had none of that. Brad Thor had none of that. Daniel Silva had none of that. And so it's certainly not a prerequisite. I think um, curiosity and the desire, you know, going back to I can only speak to Mark, but I know Mark has undergone not only just research trips but countless. Um, courses that he's gone through around protective details and how to, you know, shoot weapons and do CQB and stuff like that as part of his research. Um, I think the sometimes having the military experience can be uh, perhaps a hindrance from the standpoint of it's you can you can get into that note of you know I, I know enough or I know what's going on I don't need to do the research and for the Clancy books you always um, need to do the research for. Um, 
for zero hour there's a a pretty neat scene where jack ryan jr um gets gets uh goes for a ride on a sealed delivery vehicle and i have obviously have zero experience on that and so i actually reached out to my friend jack carr and said hey can you put me in contact with somebody that can help me with this and so he did and and um that person and i went back several times where we talked through different you know what it feel like what are here's what i want to do how do i make that work and so those things I think you still have to do regardless of the fact. I think sometimes military experience can give you, point you more towards the questions that you need to ask. Or from my perspective, a lot of my books and a lot of the, the action scenes are, are take the form of dialogue. And, and for me, the reason for that is because um, as an Apache pilot, as a cavalry officer, that's how the battle was relayed to you is that you're listening to radio calls. And so whether it's the guys on the ground and you're picturing what's happened through radio calls, whether it's, whether it's the other um, people in your formation, whether it's your higher headquarters or you're listening to scouts report in. And so you, I had to be able to, as a young officer, be able to listen to those radio calls and then develop a picture of the tactical situation and what was going on around me. And so that's a lot of time is reflected in my books and the way I tell a story. And that's certainly where um, my military experience maybe comes more in, but I, I don't get uh, the Clancy books are just the re readers are too demanding. They yeah. not too demanding They have their expectations are so high that it's, I think it's, it would be impossible to write one of those books, regardless of your background without doing a ton of research alongside it. Oh, yeah. And do not get the uh, uh, weapon wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said before, I, I feel like readers in this genre are conditioned to make a deal with the author, that there are some basic things that you have to get right, you know, whether it's from a weapons perspective or a kit perspective or equipment. And if you do that, then they'll give you the grace to do some things that maybe aren't so realistic in the service of the story. And they'll they'll grant you that. But if you don't prove yourself as knowledgeable enough in the small things, they're probably not going to trust you when it comes to the big things to to make those leaps. You know, my my first book in the Matt Drake series was without sanction. And there was a very um, in depth scene where Matt does a hey ho or a high altitude, um, high opening parachute jump. And so, I have a very good friend um, who spent the majority of his career in Delta Force. And he was kind enough to help me with that scene and read several versions of it and stuff. And so, when I got done with it, he said, You know, we would never send just one guy. You understand that, right? And I said, yeah, I understand that. And I said, was it a good story? And he said, it was a fantastic story. And I was like, well, that's that's what I care about is that you're going to give me the leeway where I'm going to do everything I can to get the technical aspects correct, knowing that, yeah, you're never going to send one guy on his own to go do this. But because I got that stuff correct, you're going to you're going to let me do that because it makes the story so much better and come along for the ride for it. And so I think in this genre, that's the the line or the balance that you always have to look at is get the stuff right that you can get right. And then hopefully that buys you the goodwill with the leader, with the readers to go do some things that make the story very fun and very unique. Superb, superb point. It is about the right. And you said something earlier about reviews. And I want to circle back to this because <clears throat> you mentioned Jack Carr too. Jack does one of those things that I absolutely love. He reads the bad reviews, which mm -hmm. there's a guy who is comfortable in who he is and yeah. realizes that uh, what we all realize that people who are going to take the time to really give you a bad review probably are not happy people in general. So do you ever go back and read any and have fun with the, any of the bad reviews? I do sometimes I do. Um, I think there was, there's another writer. Uh, her name is Sarah Grunder and she, um, I follow her on Twitter. She debuted about the same time I do her, her, her debut book. I think it's called is um, love lists and fancy ships or something like that. And so she did this whole thing on Twitter about reviews and what they meant. And her, and her thesis is that most bad reviews come from, a mismatch of expectations on the reader's part. So the reader picked up the book, expecting it to be a certain genre, to, it to follow certain conventions, it to do whatever, and that didn't happen. And so that can be the reader's fault, it can be the author's fault, it could be the marketing team's fault. 
And so I, I don't think there are some folks who are, you know, just angry human beings and are, and are looking to get on there and, and to vote. But I think the majority of them are that negative review is coming from an unmet expectation. And I think sometimes it's worthwhile figuring out why is that is that the reader was directed completely to uh, the wrong book, or maybe there is something to that and you as an author want, want to take a look at. And so if you're doing that and you're making a conscious choice to do that, okay, you know, you're deciding to deliver something that that reader doesn't particularly want. On the other hand, if you aren't making that conscious choice and they're saying, hey, this book didn't work for me for these reasons, to me, that's the same you ignore that at your peril because it's the same thing when, like I said, in my past life, I spent the majority of my time standing in front of customers and would they would take one of my product and say, I like this, I like this, this I hated, this I think you should change. I never ignored that. You know, We didn't always make those changes, but I'd always bring that back to the engineers and say, hey, this is what they're saying. This is what the customers actually want. Can we give them more of what they want? And I think at the end of the day, that's what your job as a writer to do, especially in the Clancy franchise, because it's not yours. It's not your book series. And those readers, like we talked about before, are incredibly loyal. They buy the books year after year. And your job is to give them what they want and, and to make them come back and buy that next book. And so, you know, you, you kind of got to take that with a grain of salt. You can... Uh, if you read a lot of negative reviews, it can sometimes take you to a bad headspace where you're second yeah. guessing, you know, the choices you're making as you're writing another book. But I think if there's, if there's a, and then this might be another Stephen King one he talked about in, in, in on writing, where if it's one reader that says something and you feel something else, writer wins. If there are a whole bunch of readers that are bringing up the same issue over yeah. and over again, then maybe you ought to look at that and understand why so many of your readers came expecting one thing and then left um, because they didn't, that was an unmet expectation. Yeah. And I'm going to hybrid two things. There are two different thoughts that went through my mind. Uh, and we said this earlier, there are some people that I think spend entirely too much time on social media and sure. searching for that acknowledgement or confirmation sure. of some sort. Sure. When, when in reality, if, and I look, I, we're all a, guilty of it. I certainly am. If we would funnel that energy back to just spending that quiet, contemplative yeah. time, yeah. Uh, forming the idea and in the chair crafting it, we'd be better off. But sure, that's my little tirade. Um, all right, before we get to rapid fire questions, as we get ready to wrap up, I do ha I want to ask you this. I'm, I, and I'm curious to see if it's changed any since we uh, chatted mm -hmm. almost a year ago. And that is, if if you're going to give someone up and coming struggling writer a mm -hmm. single piece of advice and it can be one or two it's not just one thing but what yeah. would you say okay this is don bentley's advice consider this yeah i think there are so when people say that they want to be writers or that they're writers and trying to get better and you know some variation of that i usually say three things that that in my opinion you have to do you have to read a lot you have to write a lot and you have to have a critique partner or somebody that's helping your writing get better and i think the when people tell me they don't read in the genre they want to write in to me that's always a red flag because at the end of the day you have a story that you want to tell and it's kind of like overlapping venn diagrams right so over here is the story you want to tell over here is what readers in that genre in, expect and hopefully there's an overlap where you're going to give them something they expect in a, you know, the same but different manner in a, in a way that is different from what's out there. If you just want to write a story and you have no idea where um, that story would be shelved, and that's, you know, the way I always frame it is tell me the three books that would be next to yours on the bookshelf. You know, would it be a Mark Graney book, a Brad Taylor book, a Daniel Silva book, a Nelson DeMille book? Right. And why? Why would those be shelved next to yours? And, and then why would yours be a little bit different when theirs are already? And so if, if you don't know that and don't know the commercial aspects, because this is a business and your business is to give readers what they want and maybe give it to them in a different way, it's going to be really hard for you to make something that readers want to buy. And that, and that goes from both your writing perspective and your reading perspective. And, and it's the same way, too, where I think, you know, going all the way back, I don't think I ever completed the thought that where Stephen King talks about the blue collar part versus the magic part, 
The blue collar part is writing every day or darn near. The magic part is when you do that, then your subconscious will work on that story and you'll be at the gym doing deadlifts and get this flash of insight or walking the dog. But that magic part only happens when the story lives in your mind. And the way that your story lives in your mind is that you work on it every day. And that's how your craft gets better. And then the third part, like I said, it, and this is why I think Thriller Fest and places like that are so good, is, is it really, really helps to have somebody who is farther along on the journey that you can, that can look at what you've written and say, hey, you really, like Nick Petrie did to me, you need another edit. And here's what that looks like, you know, and, and because it's, it's very, very hard if you're doing those first two things, it's kind of like if you're, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get better at your golf swing, but you don't have a golf pro who's helping you with that. I mean, you can <laughs> swing and swing and swing and swing, but if you don't understand what you're doing wrong, you're not going to get any better at that swing. And so those are kind of the three things that, that I try and tell folks usually. That's superb. And the golf swing is extra good because how many times have you gone out and just, oh, I'm just going to hit a bucket of balls, I'll get better. Mm -hmm. But if you're yep. doing something mechanically wrong and you're building yep. the muscle memory, then you're going right. to build that bad muscle memory in. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's absolutely right. Excellent. Well, Don, I think last time we did rapid fire questions, if I was even doing it then and back in August, <laughs> um, it was probably way more intellectual and thought provoking. <laughs> Today, it is not. Good. Good. It's, it's, That's what uh, I like to hear. We're recording this on a Monday. I've got Monday brain. So without any further ado, rapid fire questions. Super easy. Pen and paper or keyboard? Keyboard. Quiet library or a noisy coffee shop? Mm, a little bit of both. Depends what I'm doing. Now, see, usually I go, eh. <laughs> it's all right. Ball cap or Stetson? Uh, ball cap. Stetson's only when we get the cavalry back together. <laughs> Boots or sneakers? Boots. Dude, I was, sp I was staring at your very handsome boots at Thriller <laughs> Fest. Ribs or burgers? ribs beer or iced tea beer small gun or big knife mm, small gun <laughs> bigger gun or longer rifle mm, probably longer rifle yeah <laughs> plane or helicopter helicopter unless you're traveling cross country then plane <laughs> and finally for your vacation beach or mountains hmm that's a hard one. I just got back from a beach vacation, which I like, but I actually think I'm more of a mountains guy. Yeah. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 10 of those and see nobody got hurt. <laughs> Folks, if you'd like to learn more about this fantastic book, Zero Hour with Don Bentley, go to donbentleybooks.com, which by the way, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention, and I was saying this to Mark Graney just last week, one of the things that brought us all together was the website host for your website. And I told yeah. him, I said, I was researching you, Mark and Brad Taylor, and it was a company called ArthurBytes.com. Yeah. And I'm like, these guys, look, if these guys are doing it and I want to be a writer and it looks superb. And then I met them and everything <laughs> checked out. I'm like, bam. So yeah. Author Bytes is incredible. Author Bytes is incredible. Yeah. So again, donbentleybooks.com. Follow him on Twitter and Facebook at Bentley Don B. Yep. Damn. This was awesome. I mean, and this this hour flew by. Uh, I I know you you were you were on it today. I so appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, it's it's nice to be coming back a year later. Yeah. And it and it makes me go. Uh, let's see. So you've got. Did you say March or May? I heard M for uh, Matt Drake. It'll be uh, May, I think. Okay. Yep. So zero hour now, Matt Drake in May, and yep. hopefully you'll come back on the show again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Don, you're a champ. Congratulations again. Thanks so much for having me, David. It's great seeing you. Thank you again, Don. And as the old saying goes, you can never go wrong with a Tom Clancy novel. I think I just made that up. <laughs> what a great guy terrific writer and the book once again of course zero hour 
Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan Jr. Man, talking about a heck of a read. Now, speaking of heck of a reads, every once in a while we uh, debut a new author and we put it in a series called Discovering New Authors. I know I've already done that once this month, but I have had this guy on my radar for months and months and months and months. And we planned this, golly, months ago. So I thought I'm gonna get him on right now. So next week, this is a preview preview copy. The book is Shadow Tear. The author is Steve Stratton and uh, he's become a good friend. We, we met up in uh, Thriller Fest a few weeks ago, just had so much fun, really great bonding time. The guy is on his way. He's hanging out with all the right guys and studying hard and working hard. And this, look at this, it's a Lance Bear Wolf thriller. You wanna make plans to attend next week's Thriller Zone with Steve Stratton. Man, he's got the credentials behind him. Uh, from the armed forces and he has you know he loves writing and it and it shows he's also an outdoorsman and th there's so much fun uh information that i'm going to share and great conversation that we're going to have so please make plans to attend want to remind you also this very thing do us a favor swing on by our youtube channel which is growing by leaps and bounds and subscribe all you gotta do is hit that little subscribe button if you'd like to be uh, alerted of uh, upcoming episodes click the bell ding ding and you're in so that is youtube.com slash the thriller zone of course you can find us on twitter and instagram at the Thriller Zone makes so much sense. And if you're old school like me and you want to just go to a website and have it all right there where you can find your blogs and your videos and your podcast and drop us a, a review, drop us a comment, you can record a comment to us right there on the website. You'll see a little red button on the right hand side. Simply record it. Tell us what you think about the show. That is all at thethrillerzone.com. Can't miss it. Makes so much sense. Whew, man, what a great show today. I am so excited about next week with Steve Stratton. And don't forget, by the end of this month, June, celebrating our one year anniversary, we have all kinds of activity for you. We're double booked a couple places so that we can bring you more information, more entertainment, more books for you to read for your summer. And it just keeps getting better and better. I'm your host, David Temple. You make it a great week. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.